This is the closing evening of the course. After this, all we're doing is driving back to Addis Ababa and, and making our various ways home. Um, what have we done so far? We've talked about a lot of issues of planning conservation areas and a lot of issues of implementing. In fact, the last major event that Bilal ran was our grand debate amongst all of the competing interests and conflicting interests in setting up that reserve. I can't remember what it was called. Montoli. Montoli, sorry. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to fast forward a bit. Imagine that reserve or any other is set up. And it's got a decree from the president of the Republic of, is it Lihania or? Lihania. Lihania, okay. Uh, so we've, we've got this protected area in some sense implemented. It's there, it exists, it's on paper. Now how many of you have been to a park that exists on paper and doesn't really exist in the sense of protecting anything? I have. Okay, almost everybody. So how do you implement and maintain and sustain in such a way that it works long term. So that's what Bilal will be talking to us about today. Um, essentially the question is how do you maintain the integrity of that area or even build and improve the integrity of that area through time. So look for some last energy. I know it was a long day um, but this is, this is the last of the real lectures, okay? yours. Thank you. All right. Uh, Aladdin, do we have your attention? Yeah, yeah. Good. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for the very uh, good introduction on what this is about. Like I said, keep in mind, this protected area has been established. What do you do moving forward? Now I'm going to do something very intentional here which is to jump from subject to subject and I want you to draw the pieces together because this is often emblematic of some of those challenges that you will face. No one is going to give you the answer. Everyone is going to give you little pockets of information and it's going to be your job to make sense of them. Does that make sense to everyone? Thank you. All right, so here's our outline blank screen. We're going to go through a little bit of a summary that we have thus far. I'm just going to expand a little bit on what Town has, has said. We're going to go through our key learning objectives for this particular lecture. We're going to talk about some of these conceptual and theoretical debates because we have to work off the premise that whatever we might do in the future has to be grounded in something. Okay. And that's something draws from three avenues. Theory, method, evidence. Okay? Is everyone clear on those? Then we're going to talk about these obstacles to conservation practice. And if you, look, if you remember my title slide, I use the word mediating. And mediating is a really important term because you can never completely disregard, right? you have to find ways of mediating challenges or ameliorating them. And then talk about these political and social dimensions of maintaining conservation as well as some of the ecological. Now I'm not going to go quite so much into the ecological because I feel like you have a bit of that also but I'm just going to take the issue of, the cl of climate change and we're going to think about that one a little bit more. Alright? Everyone on board? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. What's my boundary? There we go. Can't go forward of that. Forward of that. You're okay. Blocking the light though, which is what light on that side. Okay. Continue, All right. So some important points thus far. Hi, Lou. Yes. I'm not allowed to move this way. Oh, no, no. Yeah. Not, I'm allowed Just to come front of. Oh, front of this. Okay. Is this okay? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. You're in front of the screen. Awesome. Okay, so summarizing some important points thus far. There's a lot to consider in conservation, right? I think some of us have been like, oh, there's this aspect, there's this aspect, there's this aspect, there's this aspect. 
great. What if you were the park manager? How do you go beyond all of these? So we've talked about, uh, Mona's talked to us quite nicely about land use changes. We've waved our arms and not really talked a lot about the human population growth dimension. Uh, Lee's given us some really great stuff on, on climate change and I've talked to you a little bit about the history of coercive conservation. And so here's my take home point. Integrity in conservation should begin at least, or attempt to begin, at becoming a little bit more broadly trained. Okay, You have to learn to incorporate different dimensions. I think when we look at some of the past failures surrounding conservation, it's because we didn't fully consider dimension A or dimension B or dimension C. Right? So how do you do that? There's a need to become more broadly trained. And here what, I, what I'm drawing on is some, some literature from human geography, which is the need to understand multiple viewpoints and what we call situated knowledge. A park manager, the, the park warden, might have a great deal of information about the eco ecosystem. And we certainly saw that in the course of our, our visits, right? They were very, very knowledgeable about certain aspects, but then when you push them further, there were some holes that were starting to appear, right? And here is my plea to you all, which is to become a little bit of a sip specialist synthesizer, okay? Become a specialist in one deep area, but have the language skills, have the necessary theoretical and methodological toolkit to at least understand those other multiple viewpoints. Okay? Everyone on board? So we've learned lessons of best practices, we've learned some lessons on tools and techniques, we've certainly looked at applications, but we don't know much about how conservation might work in the future, given changes we might not anticipate. And this is a really important thing. There are changes we can anticipate and there are changes we are not able to yet understand or appreciate. Okay? And certainly I think the challenge of climate change caught a lot of communities that did not, uh, that were not part of broad consultative uh, decisions, it caught them off guard. Right? And here, what I, what I want us to think about is what are the signs that we should be able to respond to, right? What are those early warning signs that we can respond to? So our objectives are to understand how conservation priorities shift over time, to understand the realities of demographic growth and resource scarcity with respect to people and protected areas, to think critically about the nature of enforcement as a primary mechanism surrounding the integrity of protected areas, to broaden our ideas of fixed and static conservation boundaries and to critique tourism as the potential win-win solution. Okay? We've heard very many of the positive aspects of why tourism is important, provides employment, brings in tourist revenue, helps generate park proceeds that will go funded into conservation and so on. And that's a pretty one-sided conversation without looking at the broader aspects. Okay? Okay. So let's dig into these debates. And I want to start the debate by drawing on a paper that has just recently come out in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society B. And this is by uh, Daniel Brockington and David Wilkie. And David Wilkie is from an organization, uh, part of Conser Wildlife Conservation Society, which is a very big conservation NGO called Conservation Measures. Okay? And if we take a quick glance at the abstract here, Protected areas are controversial because they are so important for conservation and because they distribute fortune and misfortune unevenly. Okay? They distribute fortune and misfortune unevenly. The nature of that distribution as well as the terrain of the protected areas themselves has been vigorously contested. They reviewed the orig origins of the debate and outlined flashpoints and ways in which further evaluation could improve the evidence base for policy making and conservation practice. And this is a big trend in the literature which is suggesting that we go to evidence based conservation. Show us the data. Right? Not, it worked over there so therefore it must work over here. That's wrong. Now, there are two basic premises when it comes to protected areas. 
First, protected areas are written into the founding stories that nations tell about themselves. This is the state album, album emblem for Uganda. It's a crested crane and what looks to be a hirola, although there are no hirola in Uganda, but some sort of antelope, right? If you look at the national emblem of Kenya, the coat of arms, it's two lions with a chicken, but forget about the chicken for now, okay? In America, the bald, eag the, the bald eagle, the symbol of freedom, right? But the local consequences of that very thing that we so proudly proclaim as part of our heritage is so deeply contested. And its reduction to a simple emblem suggests that everything is fine and dandy. So when we look at this paper by, by Brockington and Wilkie, they talk about four um, debates within the protected area, uh, flashpoints of the protected what are the forms of displacement? The what, the what, what form of the displacement matters? Is it physical? Is it economic? Is it social? So when we say people should not be in a protected area, what type of displacement are we talking about? It's not just simply displacement. You have to probe further. Here is probably the, the one, I, one of the ones I think is so important. What is the quality of the data that has been used by both sides of the debate? You go and you do four interviews and you say, ah, oh, I have a good understanding now. Not true. I interviewed the park manager and he told me that there are power dimensions at work here, right? And if you look at uh, some, you know, so it's important to note that these debates are not just happening between protected area authorities, but between scientists and social scientists themselves. We don't agree. There are flashpoints amongst the academics and practitioners as well. So those who are so well trained, deeply trained, will disagree with others over what is the right approach. Okay? Here is another flashpoint in the protected area debate. Who is entitled to consideration and compensation related to eviction or displacement? Are people who have been there for 50 years entitled to compensation if they leave? What about those that came five years ago? What about ones that came two years ago? Who counts as a local person? You'll notice in all my rhetoric thus far, I'm providing no answers. I'm simply throwing out questions for you to deeply consider. And the other really, really important one, the governance of protected areas matters and whether the local or state authority is more effective for generating conservation outcomes and local prosperity. Now, in talking to each of you over the course of these past 10 days, it has become so abundantly clear to me that this is the, one of the greatest challenges we face. Who is responsible for conservation? Is it the local authority? Is it the national government? Is it the county? Who is responsible for conservation? The moment we start saying, it is you who is responsible for conservation, or it is you who is responsible for conservation, we lose out on the debate. Okay. Now, this, come, this is the main part of the talk now, right? Obstacles in conservation practice. So these are some things that I've served the lit surveyed the literature and I've looked to see what people have said about what these obstacles to conservation practice are once the protected area is established, right? A protected area is not a static unit. A protected area will not stay the same. There is no protected in the world that has stayed the same in its, as its, in its original form, whatever that form might be. So one of the ways to think about is why conservation priorities shift as a way by which to understand the integrity of protected areas. Changes in what species and or ecosystems is are to be conserved, because I've got multiple plurals. Is there consensus on what species should be conserved and why? 